All right, all right, here we go. Uh, hey, welcome to reInvent. Um, this talk is about DynamoDB, so I hope that's why you're here. Um, quick show of hands, who's using DynamoDB, who has used it? Awesome, great, great to see. Um, so first off, just a little bit of my backstory with DynamoDB. Um, I've been using Dynamo for probably about four-ish years now. Um, three years ago, I, you know, if you asked me, I probably would have said, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good at DynamoDB. Um, about two years ago this time is when I found out that I wasn't very good at all with DynamoDB. Um, I watched Rick Houlihan's talk on YouTube from, from reInvent, and I don't know, uh, a lot of people have seen Rick's, Rick's talk before. Um, super useful, uh, really great for learning how to use DynamoDB. So this is the talk that I wish I had four years ago as I was getting started with Dynamo. Um, so yeah, this talk is data modeling with DynamoDB. Um, three big things we're gonna cover today. Uh, first off, what is DynamoDB? When would you want to use DynamoDB? Things like that. Uh, second, we'll look at some key concepts, some terminology on, on DynamoDB just to get us on the same page with, uh, especially for folks that are coming from a relational background, things like that. And then uh, once we have that background, we'll move into uh, really the meat of the talk, which is you know, some data modeling examples and some strategies and how you, how you model your data in DynamoDB. Um, so who am I? I'm Alex Debris. I'm an engineering manager at Serverless Inc. Um, I'm also an AWS data hero uh, focused on DynamoDB. Uh, two years ago when I, when I found Rick's talk and, and watched it you know, 15 times over Christmas break, I made this uh, dynamodbguide.com, which is just like a free resource for learning about DynamoDB, trying to be in a you know, user-friendly way. Um, I'm also working on a book, dynamodbbook.com, so check that out. Um, you know, if you like this talk, I'd, I'd say you'll like that. There'll be some, some more data modeling examples there. Uh, I tweet at Alex B. Debris if you're a, a Twitter fan. Uh, I also blog at alexdebris.com, a lot of different AWS stuff. Uh, before we start, just a few related breakouts I wanna, I wanna mention. First of all, DAT301, these are um, builder sessions, so I'm doing a few of these. Matthew Bonning's doing a few of these as well, but you can just get together with us and, and talk about how to model DynamoDB uh, in, in kind of a personal way, so that's great. Um, DAT325, this is an awesome one. I love all these under the hood talks, which like sh it shows you how AWS runs their services. And, and if you just think about the scale of DynamoDB and the pieces involved, uh, it's pretty cool to see what they're doing there. So go check that one out. And then DAT403, the, that's Rick Houlihan's talk, Advanced Design Patterns with DynamoDB. I went to that this morning, it was awesome. There's a repeat session on Wednesday at seven. Definitely check that out or on, on YouTube. Um, if you wanna kind of compare and contrast Rick's talk and this talk, I would say Rick, does a great job of really going wide on a bunch of use cases and showing you all the different things you can do with DynamoDB, and he packs a ton into like 50 minutes, um, but your, your head's gonna be swimming, you're probably gonna have to watch it a couple times. Um, this talk, we're, we're, I'm gonna try and get some depth, so really just go deep on one use case. If you're not really understanding some of Rick's things, come here, learn some of those basic principles and see what that's like, and then go back and watch Rick's talk, and, and hopefully you'll get more out of it. Um, all right, so let's hop in. What is DynamoDB, right? <clears throat> so uh, DynamoDB is a NoSQL database. NoSQL, you know, this kind of, uh, we saw a lot of NoSQL databases pop up in the, you know, 2000s when all these internet scale applications came online and, and sort of the access patterns they had and the amount of traffic, um, you know, relational databases couldn't handle it. So you saw things like MongoDB, Cassandra, uh, and Dynamo popping up during this time. Um, and the interesting thing about DynamoDB is that second point is that it's fully managed by AWS, right? Um, so you don't have to worry about um, adding servers, patching servers, upgrading servers, failovers, any of that stuff. Um, I think you're seeing a, a, a really big movement to having fully managed databases like uh, Amazon RDS, things like that. I think that's even more critical when you're talking about NoSQL because um, what you have are clusters of machines, right? And your data is split across it. And just the more machines you have, the more you have to take care of. Um, you have to worry about met cluster membership and, and failovers and, and you know, increasing cluster size. So I think in NoSQL, you really wanna have a fully managed database. Um, third thing that's interesting about Dynamo there is that you know, most databases use a persistent TCP connection, reuse that connection for a while. Um, not the case with Dynamo. You know, it uses an HTTPS connection, so a more stateless connection model. It uses AWS IAM for authentication. So if you're using compute on AWS, like you know, EC2 instances, uh, Lambda functions, stuff like that, you've, you've probably got a role associated with that compute. It works really well uh, with interacting with that. You don't really have to worry about auth as much, which is great, or, or at least about rotating auth tokens and things like that. Uh, and then finally, the fourth, the fourth thing there, and, and the, the reason a lot of people use DynamoDB is that you get fast, consistent performance as it scales. 
Um, so you know, you, you're going to get single digit millisecond latency, and that's going to be true at you know, one gigabyte when you're, you're starting your, your, um, your application. It's going to be true at 100 gigabytes or a terabyte or 10 terabytes. You're still going to get that consistent performance, which is, which is pretty great. Um, so when would you use DynamoDB? There are two big, big areas that I like to talk about. Uh, the first one, and really what DynamoDB was made for, are these hyperscale use cases, right? So uh, when you just have so much data, you're throwing at it and accessing it so quickly that maybe a relational database can't keep up. And this is things like Amazon.com, Shopping Cart, right? Really the, the sort of foundations for Dynamo were, were developed at Amazon.com as they're going through Black Friday and Cyber Monday and Prime Day and all that stuff and realizing that their Oracle databases aren't going to be able to keep up very much longer. Um, so you see that now Amazon.com uh, is, is pretty much fully on DynamoDB as well as you know, tier one services in AWS uh, using DynamoDB. Uh, another example there is Lyft. Um, so Lyft does like, all the geolocations for their, their rides in DynamoDB. So if you think about you know, all the rides that are happening, you know, not, not just here in Vegas taking people to and from the airport, but uh, across the United States, across the world, um, and all those locations are updating every couple seconds. It's a pretty, pretty high volume service and Dynamo is able to handle that. Um, in addition to this, this hyperscale use case, there's uh, what I call the hyper-ephemeral compute use case. This is how I sort of got into DynamoDB, uh, the more serverless stuff, right? So if you're using compute like AWS Lambda or AWS AppSync, anything like that, where you have this real ephemeral compute and you might have uh, huge numbers of it scaling up really quickly and then scaling back down, it doesn't really work as well in these relational databases, right? They weren't built for hyper-ephemeral compute like that, coming from all over, um, things like that. Um, DynamoDB, because of its HTTPS connection model, because of this like, global request, re request router layer they have, they're able to handle this scale pretty easily in a way that a relational database couldn't. So uh, I think that's another place you're seeing it be really popular. All right, cool. So let's dive into some key concepts with Dynamo. Um, first four key concepts you need to think about, these are table, item, primary key, and attributes. Uh, we're going to walk through this with an example. So. Uh, imagine you have an application that needs some, some authorization, authentication. Um, so you have a session store, right? As users log in, uh, you authenticate them and, and create a, a session, store that in them and give them, that session back to them. On subsequent requests, they'll include that session in a cookie or a header or something like that. Um, so you might have some data like this. Here, I've got a, a couple records here with some uh, Marvel characters in it. Um, so these four different characters um, are in my session store and all the data together, this is called a table. Right? And this is, this is just like, a, it, it's similar to a table in a relational database uh, or, or maybe a collection in MongoDB. If you look at a single record, that's going to be called an item. That's going to be similar to a row in a relational database or a, a document in MongoDB. Now, when you create a table, you're going to have to specify a primary key, and that primary key is going to need to be included on every item that goes into your table. Um, so on this one, you know, the session ID is our primary key. That's how we're going to access our data. Uh, it has that unique UUID that we'll generate. We'll store it in the table and give it back to the user for them to return to us. <laughs> that primary key needs to uniquely identify every item in your table, right? So you're not going to have two items that have the same primary key. They would, they would override each other if that happened. And then finally, in addition to the, to the primary key, you can have other attributes, right? And this is uh, stuff like username created at, expires at. Um, this, this is uh, free form and flexible, so you don't need to define these up front. You can... Um, have these on your items. So somewhat similar to columns in a relational database, except that you have that flexibility. You don't need to define them up front, and they can differ uh, across items in your table. Uh, so let's dive a little deeper into primary keys, as, as they're going to be pretty critical. Um, all your access patterns are going to be driven off your primary keys. So you really need to do a lot of thinking about how you're going to access your data, how you model that data, and then how you model your primary keys. Uh, there are two kinds of primary keys. First one is a simple primary key. This, is, this has just a partition key. This is what we saw with that session store um, a second ago. Um, you can also have a composite primary key, which has a partition key and a sort key. So again, let's look at that session store. It's a, it's a simple primary key. It has just that session ID, uh, which is the partition key. Um, you can have another example. Say we're storing you know, actors and actresses and the movies that they've uh, played in. Uh, so maybe we use a composite primary key there, and we have the actor or actress name as the partition key, and then the movie name as the sort key. Um, and as you can see there, I've got two records with Tom Hanks, um, but um, it's still considered unique because it's the combination of, of that partition key and the sort key that makes it unique. So even though I have two records with Tom Hanks, they're different movies, so they can, uh, they can be in that table. All right, let's, let's get into some API actions. Um, 
the way you interact with DynamoDB is, is going to be usually with the AWS SDK. Um, so it's very API driven and there's, um, rather than sort of query driven like it would be in a relational database, you know, select star from whatever. Instead of that, you're going to have more sort of APIs that you're writing in a programming language. Um, I split it up into, I split the API up into sort of three main buckets. Uh, the first one is going to be item based actions, right? And this is going to be anytime you're uh, writing, updating, deleting an item, anytime you're acting on a single item, you're going to be using these item based actions. Um, so the important part about an item based action is you must provide the entire primary key when you're doing that, right? So if you wanted to uh, delete Tom Hanks and cast away from your database, you need to say, hey, delete, you know, where uh, partition key is Tom Hanks and, and sort key is cast away, you need to delete that. Um, and then note that you can only do these uh, sort of one item at, item at a time, or you can do it in some batch requests, but you can't say, you know, um, delete all items where actor equals Tom Hanks. You need to specify that whole primary key when you're acting on these items. Uh, the second bucket of API actions is a query action. That's going to be a read-only action, but it allows you to fetch multiple items in a single request, which is, which is really powerful. Um, so if we look at this, you know, going back to that movie example, uh, you know, if your application was showing the movies for these different actors, someone clicks on Tom Hanks' page, you say, hey, give me all the movies for Tom Hanks, uh, it can give you, you know, Tom Hanks and Castaway. So the important thing with the query is that you must provide uh, the partition key when you're doing that, so I must specify the actor, you know, Tom Hanks. Um, I can opt optionally provide sort key conditions as well. So I could come here and just say, hey, give me all Tom Hanks movies, no conditions at all. Or I could say, hey, give me all Tom Hanks' movies that are between A and M in the alphabet, right? And that's going to give me Castaway, but not Toy Story. So that's how query works. Uh, last big bucket of API actions is going to be the scan operation. This is going to be similar to a, a, a scan in a relational database. It's going to be a full table scan. It's going to look at every item in your table. Um, you mostly want to avoid this when you can, uh, unless you really know what you're doing or you're doing like an export, an ETL, something like that. You want to avoid the scan. It's going to be expensive at scale. It's going to be expensive uh, in terms of how long it takes to respond to requests, and it's going to be expensive in terms of how much uh, capacity you need to, to service that. All right, last, last terminology I want to get into um, before we get into the example is secondary indexes. So we talked about how primary keys are going to be really important for modeling your data. We're going to see a lot of that. Um, but, but what happens if you get into the situation where maybe you have five access patterns, uh, you, you design your primary key and that works for two of them, but it doesn't work for your other three access patterns. How do you add these additional access patterns? And that's where secondary indexes come in. You declare these on your table and, and basically you give it a new primary key or, or a key schema is what it's called. And um, now when an item is written into your table, it's going to be replicated into that secondary index in that new shape, right? So you don't need to worry about dual writing to two tables in two different formats or something like that. It's going to handle that replication for you and give you those additional query patterns on those secondary indexes. And you can use that query, those scan operations on those secondary ind indexes just like you could um, with your primary key. So let's take a look at why that might be useful. Again, let's look at our um, actors and, and movies database. Right? We saw how we could query for actors and actresses, but what if we want to flip it? What if we want to query by the movie name and, and give me everyone that's in Toy Story, right? Um, what we'll do is we'll declare this secondary index, and, and right here we're, we're just going to flip the partition key and the sort key. So movie becomes our partition key, and actor becomes our sort key. This is what our GSI looks like. It's the exact same data. The big thing that's happened here is just that partition key and sort key have flipped. Now movie is my partition key. I can query that. Um, that index directly by movie, and I can say, hey, give me all the actors and actresses that are in Toy Story. You give me Tom Hanks, it'll give me Tim Allen, and, and I'm good to go. Hold on, I'm gonna take a drink. All right, now it's the fun part, I hope. Um, let's get into a dating modeling example here and sort of see what that looks like in practice, right? We know the concepts, let's see what it, how we do it. Um, big thing here is, is you really want to work with a process, right? And I think these are the, the three big steps you need to go through. Um, first of all, start with an ERD. This is an, enterprise, er, an entity relationship diagram. Uh, you should be making it in a, in a relational world as well, but basically an entity relationship diagram, you know, thinks about your application, say, what entities do I have in my application, um, and how do they relate to each other, right? Do I have a one-to-many relationship, one-to-one, many-to-many relationship? So get that all modeled out. Um, now, if you know, if you're working with a relational database, usually you take your ERD and, and you ship it directly to the database, right? Your entities become tables, you set up your foreign keys to map up these relationships, and, and you're good to go. That's not how it happens with DynamoDB. 
Um, so Dynamo, step two, you need to define your access patterns. So go talk to your PM, your biz analyst, whoever it is, and say, hey, how are we going to use this application? How are we going to fetch these entities, manipulate these entities? Uh, what are our access patterns? And, and really write those down. Don't just sort of think about it. Uh, really write those down and make sure you can um, handle each of those. Uh, then when you've written down all your access patterns, that's when you get into it. You design your primary key. You design your secondary indexes to handle these access patterns specifically. Um, I, for people coming from a relational world, I think it's, it's tough. You gotta forget your relational experience in a, in a lot of places. Um, a couple places I see that happening most often is number one, normalization. You know, we've learned normalization, third normal form, all that stuff, don't duplicate your data, all that stuff for a long time. Um, and that just doesn't work with Dynamo. And, that, and the reason that doesn't work is because of that second point, there are no joins in Dynamo, uh, so you can't join your data together, right? So in a relational database, you normalize your data, uh, when you're writing it, and then when you query it, that's when you sort of aggregate it back together in joins and return it to the user. Uh, the problem is those joins get expensive at scale. So rather than having these, this flexible query language, these flexible joins, what you do is sort of pre-aggregate your data. You denormalize it so that it's in the shape that you want to retrieve it in um, when, it, when read time comes around. Uh, the third big thing I see people struggle with is, is they're used to having one entity type per table, right? So you go back to your ERD, uh, if you got a couple entities on there, you make a table for each one, and, and, and that's how, where they go. Uh, with DynamoDB, you're probably going to have a couple different entity types in a single table, right? So um, whereas in a relational, you might have a user's table and an order's table. Now they're going to be in the same table. That's going to be kind of weird. We're going to look at, at how you do that, how you manage the, uh, manage the stay sane as well. All right, cool. So let's get into the example. Um, we have a, our example is going to be an e-commerce store, right? So we're going to... We're gonna compete with Amazon. Uh, our at our store, users make orders, and an order can have multiple items, right? Because uh, maybe when I go and order, I can order a, a t-shirt and a basketball, different things like that. Um, so first step, we're gonna create our ERD, right? And nothing different here from a relational database. Uh, map out your ERD, know your entities, know your relationships, and, and how they relate to each other. Um, here's the ERD I came up with. I've got four different entities and three relationships between them. Uh, let's start in the top left there, so I've got the the user's entity, which is, you know, a user's gonna create, create an account, give me their name, their address, uh, date of birth, things like that. Um, then going down in the bottom left, uh, there's the user address entity, so a user might have multiple mailing addresses, right? Because maybe I wanna mail uh, sometimes to my house, sometimes to my business, sometimes uh, to my parents' house for gifts, things like that. So there, there's a one to many relationship between users and addresses. Uh, then going across on the top, a user can have multiple orders, right? Because hopefully they're gonna come back to your store, they're gonna order a bunch of times, uh, you're going to make a big IPO, all that stuff. So, so multiple orders for a user, and then down on the, uh, going down the right, an order can have multiple order items, right? Because you can be ordering a book, a basketball, a T-shirt, all that stuff. So, so each item in that order is going to get put into the order item. All right, so next step, got to find your access patterns, right? That's our, our second step in this process. I went and talked to our PM. These are the access patterns I came up with. Number one, get user profile, right? So if someone's searching around on your site and they click, click themselves, they want to see you know, their name, their address they've got set up, their credit cards, uh, their email, all that stuff. So, so fetch that user profile. Um, second access pattern we have is, is fetch all the orders for a user, right? So if I'm looking at my profile, I want to look at my order history and see how many times I've bought something from our site. Uh, the third one falls out of that, and that's when you want to fetch a single order in the order items, right? So I'm looking through my order history. I see one that's kind of interesting. Why did I spend, you know, $120 last July? I click on that. It shows me the order. I, it shows me the order and all the order items. I can see what I bought. Um, the fourth one is, uh, you know, similar to the second, where get all the orders for a user by status, right? So if I have a lot of orders, maybe I just want to look at my canceled orders or my returned orders or the orders that are being shipped right now or the orders that I've placed and haven't shipped, all that stuff. So as a user, I can filter down and see what I want to get there. And then finally, this last use case is kind of interesting. Um, this is not a user-facing use case, but um, for the warehouse crew, right? I have some warehouse people that, that go and pick the orders, put it in a box, and get it shipped. So uh, they just want a way to know, like, across our, our entire store, what are some orders that are open so I can go pick it, uh, get it boxed up, and get ready to go. So get, get an open order across our entire uh, store. All right, so we've got our five axis patterns. Time to dive in, uh, start modeling our, our primary keys and secondary indexes. Uh, and this can, be, this can be tricky to start, especially when you're new with Dynamo. Uh, it, it can be tricky to figure out how to get started here. 
and you might start going down the road, uh, you know, kind of work yourself into a corner and realize you need to back up, erase some stuff, and, and remodel it. So don't be afraid to iterate on this. Uh, it's, it's much it easier to iterate at this stage than once that code's live in production and your data is there. So, so make sure you, uh, you know, take the time to do this right. Um, when getting started, I usually like to start with like a core entity in our, in our application, right? So we have four entities. Um, I'd say the core entities would be either user or orders. Those are kind of core to the application. And the, the user address and order items, those are more peripheral. Um, so I'm going to start with the users and, and put a user into our table. Um, so let's load two, two items into our table, um, two users. This is me, Alex, and we also got Ned Stark um, in our table. Um, two sort of interesting things I want to point out here. Number one, the primary key, right? So we're using a composite primary key. It's got both the partition key and the sort key. Uh, but notice that we've given the partition key and the sort key very generic names. It's just PK and SK. It's not something like user ID or order ID or anything like that. Um, and the reason is we're going to have multiple entity types into this table. So um, you need to make something that, that sort of works for all of them. And user ID you know, works for users, but it doesn't work for orders or order items, things like that. So you give it very generic names. These are just used for data access, and the real data is, is probably going to be in your attributes. That's the first thing to note. Um, second thing to note here is, is each of those user um, objects, the PK is, starts with you know, capital user hash and then has the username. Um, that might, might look kind of weird. Um, a couple of reasons you do this. Um, this helps you determine sort of what type of entity you're working with, right? So this is a, a user entity. Um, this is useful for if you're trying to debug maybe in the console or figure something out, you can say, okay, I know this is a user entity. That's what I'm working with. Um, it can also help prevent overlaps. So imagine you had users and, you, and orders, and they each had IDs, and if they could have the same ID, then you'd, you'd sort of overwrite each other. Um, whereas, you know, if they have this prefix, different types can have different IDs, and they'll, and they'll work. Um, also, these, these values can be useful for querying and sorting, and we'll see a little bit of that later on as well. Um, so it can be a little confusing to, to sort of understand what your, your sort of entity patterns are. Um, one thing I like to do is I make it, I don't know, I call it an entity chart. Um, but what I do is just write the entity types I have down the left side, and then for each of those entities, I say, hey, what's the PK pattern, and what's the SK pattern for that entity, right? So for, in, in this case, for my user, that PK pattern is gonna be user hash username, and that SK pattern is going to be hash profile hash username, right? And that's what every, every user that I put into my table is going to, going to look like in their PK and SK. All right, so we've modeled one entity in our table. Um, we're going to look at one-to-many relationships here. And one thing that's interesting about DynamoDB is, you know, with a relational database, there's generally like one way to do something, right? If you're adding a one-to-many relationship, you, you add a foreign key and you're done. Uh, with Dynamo, it, it sort of depends, right? It depends on, on your data. It depends on um, how you're going to access that data, different things like that. And there's going to be different ways to model your relationships. So you really have to just like know a couple of different strategies and know when to use each one of those. Um, so we're going to walk through three different one-to-many relationships here. Um, so we have our four entities with our three re relationships. Let's start with this uh, relationship on the left side. So a user has multiple user addresses, right? Because I might want to ship to my house, my business, um, a relative's house, something like that, right? And as you start thinking about user addresses, how am I going to model this relationship? Um, the first thing I think is, okay, do I have any access patterns that, that operate on the address directly? And, you know, I don't have a fetch by address or a fetch user by address or anything like that. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And then number two, the number of user addresses that a user can have is, is going to be pretty bounded, right? I, I, can, I can easily say, hey, you only get 10 addresses that you can save. You can't save... 400 or something like that. Um, whereas like a different relationship, like users and orders, I don't want to sort of bound the number of, of orders that they can have, because I want them to keep coming back over time. Um, so, so anyway, those, those are both uh, two interesting things. And given that, given I'm not going to access that address directly, and also that it's a bounded thing, I'm just going to denormalize this data. right? So I have my user profile. These are the same two profiles I showed earlier. And all I've done is I've add, added this addresses attribute, where I store these addresses on this user. Um, and you can use you know, complex data types like maps and lists um, in, in your attributes, and I'm just storing these, these addresses there. So you can see uh, you know, Alex has a home address, and Ned's got a home and a business address there. Um, so that's the first way you can, you can handle these one-to-many relationships, is that uh, just denormalizing your data and, and putting it in a document. Uh, if we go back to our entity chart, we don't need to add an entry in our entity chart for user address, because you're not fetching that directly. There's no separate entity exactly. It's, it's just part of that user. 
All right, so now let's look at a, a second one-to-many relationship. This is users to orders, um, and, and you know, a user can have multiple orders. The way we're gonna model this is, is probably the most common way you're gonna model one-to-many relationships, and that's just using a composite primary key and using that sort key. Um, so I've added a few orders to this table. Uh, I'm gonna walk through a little bit about that order first, and then we'll, then we'll see how to, how to do that one-to-many stuff. But if you can see here, I've added five orders. One of them is, is highlighted there. Um, the, the PK pattern there is order hash, and then it's got an order ID. Um, and then a couple interesting things to note is just look at the attributes on that compared to the user profile, right? So my order has an order ID, it has a status, um, whereas you know, my user has a, a full name and an email. So there are just attributes on each one of them that, that don't make sense for the other one, but it's okay. I can have different attributes on different entity types. Uh, Dynamo's not gonna uh, get mad about that. I can, I can uh, be kind of free form with my attributes there. If we go back to our entity chart, how, we mo how are we modeling that order in our table? Um, so the order, the PK is user hash username, and then the sort key is order hash order ID. Um, interesting thing to note here, notice that user and order have the same PK. So they're gonna be within the same partition, right? Uh, which, is, which is crucial. Um, so now if we wanna say, hey, go get all the orders for a particular user, I could use a query like this. This is kind of DynamoDB uh, pseudocode, I would say, but, but fairly close. Um, you know, run this query where the PK is, is user hash Alex Debris, and then I'm gonna use the begins with operator and say, hey, make sure my uh, sort key begins with order hash. That's gonna go to my table, it's gonna go to the right user partition, and it's gonna select just the orders. It's not gonna fetch me the user profile, it's gonna select me just the orders and return those back to me. Um, so that's that uh, second one-to-many relationship you use where you're using a composite primary key, using that sort key value to find what you want. Uh, let's look at our third one-to-many relationship here. Uh, on the right side, uh, an order can have multiple order items, right, because I can order a basketball, a book, a t-shirt, all in one order. Um, and you might think, uh, let's just take that last strategy and run it back, right? Um, why can't we just do that again? Uh, the problem here is that we're doing, we're trying to model a one-to-many relationship of something that's already the object of a one-to-many relationship, right? So our users have orders and our orders have order items. Um, and, and that's not gonna work to use that composite primary key to go down another level. Um, so let's walk through how we might model this. I've added some items here at the bottom of the table um, that are highlighted in red there. Um, you can see the primary key is um, item hash, item ID, and the order is, or the sort key, sorry, is order hash, order ID. Going back to our entity chart, we've got those all in our table, right? We've completed our entity chart. Order item is order hash, item ID, or item hash, item ID. Uh, sort key is order hash, order ID. Important thing to note there is the sort key is the same for orders and order items, right? So that's important to note. If we go look at our table, we can see that those, those sort keys are the same. So I've highlighted um, the order, that, that one's the one up top there in the user, the Alex Debris partition, um, but then we got the order items that are down below. They're in a different partition right now, right? So I can't access them with a single query. This is where I'm gonna add my first secondary index. I'm gonna use a strategy that's called an inverted index, uh, which is just, if you have a composite primary key and, and you flip the partition key and the sort key values, uh, that's an inverted index. Um, so that's what we'll do here. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Here's our index. Again, this is all the same data. The only, it's all been replicated over. The only thing that's different is I have a different uh, primary key on this index, right? So in this case, uh, SK is now my primary key and PK is now my sort key. Um, if I, um, and now if I wanna get an order and the order items, I can do that. I can go straight to that order partition and pull it back. Uh, the interesting thing to note here is notice that I'm pulling back two different types of entities in a single request, right? I'm getting the order, which is that, that first item there that has the PK of user hash Alex Debris, but I'm also getting the two items. So I'm getting two different types of data in one request. This is doing that join for us, right? We're, we're pre-aggregating our data in the ways that we wanna access it. Um, and, and this is how Dynamo can, can be fast um, and, and, and at any scale, right? So just to recap what we looked at there, um, we looked at three different one-to-many relationship patterns, right? And, and we had three different patterns and we, we accomplished them in three different ways. Uh, the first one we used was an attribute. We denormalized those user addresses and just put them into a map onto our user profile. Uh, the second one we did, we used a primary key and used that query. That's gonna be the most common way uh, you do that. Um, and, and the final way is, is similar, you know, but if your primary key is already used for something else, then you can add a secondary index uh, to give you those same, same kind of uh, semantics and use that query on that secondary index. 
All right, let's hop into filtering. Uh, this is a section sort of like the one to many. We're gonna walk through a couple different examples. Um, you know, if you're talking about database and, and data design and data access, it, it's really a big exercise in filtering, right? Because what you have is you have a lot of data and at different types, you want this data but not that data or that data but not this data, and you need to figure out how to do that uh, efficiently, how you do it quickly and, and cheaply, right? <laughs> and if you're coming from a relational world, you've, you've been spoiled uh, because you have this, this where clause, right? It's super flexible, you can do anything you want with it. Um, you can, you can uh, only look for, for items or rows with a particular column name. You can use these built-in functions. You can join and filter on a, a joined value. Um, and there's, there's nothing really comparable in DynamoDB, right? You need to, to build your filtering into your primary key. Um, but before we get too far in that, I do wanna talk about filter expressions, because you might go out and, and Google, um, or you might be looking through the SDKs, and you see filter expression, and you think it's gonna save you, and it won't save you. Um, so let's look at this example here. Um, again, these are our users and our orders. Um, I've highlighted two items there, or two, excuse me, two orders. They both have the status of shipped, right? And let's say uh, across my entire database, I wanna look for, for just the, item, the orders that are in that shipped status, right? And uh, if you're looking through the documentation, you might see that filter expression. So, so here's some, some pseudocode using Python. Uh, you imp import Boto3, which is the AWS SDK for Python. You create this client, and you say, hey, I'm gonna query, I'm gonna query my table, and I'm gonna give it this filter expression that says status equals shipped, right? And it's just gonna give me exactly what I want back. Um, the problem here, I'm gonna take us back to a slide from the beginning uh, about when we we're talking about the query API, right? And, and when you're doing a query, you have to provide the partition key in that query, right? So you can only do a query within a particular partition. Uh, the problem here, our orders are in two different partitions, right? One is Ned Stark's, one is mine. Uh, you can't query across partitions, so that's not gonna work. Um, so, so this went out the window, but you, know, you keep uh, looking through the documentation and you notice that scan also allows a filter expression. And, and you probably think, hey, I'm smarter than Alex. He told me not to do scan, but um, I'm gonna do it anyway because I'm using this filter. I'm not gonna be looking through stuff. Um, and you probably are smarter than me, but I'm gonna tell you it's not gonna save you here. Um, so let's look at how a scan works, right? Uh, or sorry, a filter expression works. When you, when you push off that scan uh, to the back end, the first thing that DynamoDB is gonna do is read items from your table. Once it has those items in memory, then it's gonna look and see if you have a filter expression defined. And if you do, it's gonna filter out any items that don't match that, that filter expression. And then it's gonna return those items to you, right? So you only get the items that match your uh, filter expression. The problem, is if you go back to step one, there's a one megabyte limit um, when reading items from the table, right? So imagine you have a gigabyte of data in a table, which is not a big table. Um, what that's gonna do is, is if you're doing a scan with a filter expression, that's gonna take a thousand requests to your table um, there and back to handle this. So that, that filter expression isn't gonna save you. It's gonna save a little bit of bandwidth on the wire. It, you know, maybe you don't have to filter as much in your application, but other than that, it's, it's not gonna save you and, and make more efficient queries. So don't rely on that filter expression. Um, when you're filtering, you have to build it into your primary key. You have to build it into your secondary indexes, into those designs up front, right? So, so let's look at a few access patterns we have that are filtering based, and, and we'll see how, to, see how to implement those, like we did at the one-to-many relationship. Um, so first one here, get orders for a user, right? Um, and, and if you're working in SQL, this would be you know, select star from orders, where username equals uh, Alex, right? Um, and we already sort of looked at this in the one-to-many relationship, so I'm gonna go quickly here, but um, that query we have would be, you know, give me, uh, give me the items where the PK is user Alex Debris, and, and give me the items where, and where that uh, SK begins with order hash, right? And what we're doing is um, we're using that partition key to filter down to just the items we want. Just go to that user's partition and find the orders there. When we do that, you know, our table goes directly to that partition, it finds the order items, fetches them, and returns back to you. So that's our first uh, filtering access pattern, right? We're not getting all the orders, we're getting the orders for a specific user. That's how we filter down using that, that PK. Um, the second filtering access pattern we have is get orders by status for a user, right? So as a user is looking through their order history, things like that, uh, they don't wanna look at uh, all their orders, maybe they wanna look at the ones they canceled or returned or, or that are being delivered, things like that. Uh, if you were writing this in SQL, you might have something like this. Select star from orders where username is Alex Debris and status equals shipped. Right? And, and so what I wanna do here is, uh, I guess if, if we look at the, the 
orders in, in our table, right, and if we look at Alex Debris' orders, we see that there's this status attribute um, over on the far right. Um, it's, it's in the attributes, though. It's not in a primary key. It's not something we can query. Um, what we're going to do here, this, the pattern we're going to use here is called a composite, uh, composite sort key. So first, we're going to add an attribute that combines the status and the created at date, right? So uh, we're making this additional attribute. We're going to call it order status date. And all it did is jam those two um, existing attributes together and separate them by a pound sign, right? So, so that first one, it was placed. It was created at on uh, you know, April 21st, 2019. So I get that order status date of placed, hash, and then the date. So now I have this order status date in my table. Um, and now what I can do on that is I can, I can add a secondary index using that value, right? So I'm going to make a secondary index where uh, the partition key, key is the PK from our table, and the sort key is going to be that order status date. <clears throat> if we look at that, this is, this is what that's going to look like. I've got, I've got my um, order sort of rearranged again, separating those user partitions, but it got this order status date as the sort key. And then if I want to get just the ones that are shipped, um, now I can write a query like this, you know, go to that secondary index, use the PK where user equals uh, user hash Alex debris and, and where the order status date begins with shipped. It's going to go to that table and it's going to find exactly the item I want, right? So it's going to go to my partition and it's going to find uh, the order with that status. Um, the interesting thing about using that composite sort key here is you could use it to filter on, on both of those attributes, right? So I could filter down much more narrowly if I wanted to. I could say, hey, give me all the items for Alex debris that were shipped between um, April and June of this year, and you could, you could do that, or, or um, that were shipped before um, Christmas of this year, things like that. So you can use both of those properties, both the status and the, the order date um, in, your, in your queries. So that one was um, <coughs> the composite sort key. Last filtering pattern we want to get to, into is this get open orders pattern. Again, this isn't a user-facing pattern. This is for your warehouse crew, right? They want to um, query across your whole database and just find an open order that's ready to be picked um, so they can go pick it and, and say that it's ready and move on to the next one. Uh, and this is a pretty hard query for DynamoDB generally uh, because mostly with DynamoDB, you want to sort of narrow down to a partition first and then query within that partition. Uh, but this is like a global query, right? How do I query across my entire table? Uh, which is tricky, pretty tricky here. So in SQL world, this is select star from orders where status equals placed. Um, so if we look at our table here, we have three orders that are in that place status, but again, they're in different partitions. How do we enable this? How do we provide kind of a global filter over our table? Um, we're gonna use uh, what's called the sparse index pattern. So first of all, we're gonna add another attribute, just like we were doing with that order status state. And any order that's in the placed status, we're just gonna add an attribute called placed ID, right? This, this attribute can be anything. It can be the order ID. It can just be a random hash, whatever. Um, the whole point is just that it exists on that item when it's in that placed state. And then we're gonna create a, a secondary index on that placed ID. Um, now, the way secondary indexes work is, you know, you declare uh, the key elements, uh, the key schema of that secondary index, and it's only gonna replicate data from your main table that has all the elements of your key schema. Um, so if you look at that, um, you know, our user profile objects, they don't have a placed ID. Um, any order that's in uh, a different status that's not in the place status is not going to have that place ID. Our order items, they won't have the placed ID. So all we get in this GSI are our orders that are in the place status. Now our application, you know, that our warehouse crew is using, they can, they can go to this. They can actually use that scan operation on that index and say, hey, scan that, scan that index. Give me one item back. It doesn't matter where it is. It's just going to be a, sort of a random one. They'll go pick that, that item. When they're done picking that item, they'll come back, say, hey, this, this order's picked. Um, as it gets update from placed to ready or, or whatever status that would be, then that place ID gets ripped off of it. Um, and now it's going to be removed from that sparse index because it doesn't have that place ID anymore. So now they can go retrieve a different item from that table. All right, so just like we did with uh, the one-to-many relationships, right, we looked at some different filtering patterns here, and we looked at uh, three different problems we had and three different ways to solve it. Uh, the first one, the most popular one, is going to be using that primary key where you're going to be filtering down within a partition or maybe with, um, you know, using that sort key. Uh, the second one, we use that composite sort key where we combine two different properties together, indexed on that, which allows us to query on, on sort of the first one or both of, the, both of those properties if we want to. The last pattern we looked at was the sparse index, which, which provides us a global filter on our table, right, and um, allows us to, to weed out a bunch of items that we don't care about and get us just down to what we want. So that's all I have. 
Um, yeah, thanks for coming today. I'll be around for questions if anyone wants to ask questions. Thank you.